Grace Otham was the curator of the, of the photo collection. And I was complaining to her because I just couldn't find any new photos of, of women. Um, you know, I had Bess Truman, I had uh, lots of women doing cooking and things like that from Missouri. And she just kind of, she went to her files and she just picked this photo up and just kind of tossed it in front of me of these women lined up and it's along Locust Street in St. Louis. And I just, I just gasped. I just could not believe what I was looking at. And I said, what, what is this? And she said, it's the Golden Lane. And uh, of course, you know, I was hooked after that. I had to find out what, what it was, what was, what was going on in St. Louis in uh, 1916. So I, I'd like to start just by reading the um, first part of my book and it'll explain because I think there's probably some folks who, who don't, who probably feel like I did that day back in the 90s when I had never seen a picture of it before. It was June 14th, 1916 a warm, sticky Wednesday morning. The Democratic Convention would soon meet in St. Louis at the Coliseum, the world's largest convention center. Inside the Jefferson Hotel, the men ate breakfast and met with their committees. Perhaps they chatted about the war in Europe, noted that Woodrow Wilson had the election locked up, or remarked that the bread was darn fresh. The freshness of the bread might have led to praise for the city with its modern lights, purified water, skyscrapers, and electric streetcar system. Delegates might even have expressed surprise, comparing St. Louis to the cities on the East Coast, the West Coast, and of course, its Midwest rival, Chicago. The comings and goings of delegates and spectators added to the traffic, noise, and bustle of the city street. Aromas from the restaurants, automobiles, horses, harness, coal smoke from the electric plant gave the place a distinctive gritty odor. Now outside the hotel, thousands of women quietly took their places on the sidewalk. By 10 o'clock in the morning, they were lined for blocks along both sides of Locust Street, shoulder to shoulder, each in a dress that brushed the pavement shading herself with a yellow parasol and wearing a yellow sash that read votes for women. The Golden Lane spread for a mile on both sides of Locust Street, forming a peaceful walkless talkless parade with women from all over the nation. The message was clear. We have made every reasonable argument time and again to prove that we carry the burdens of modern life just as men do, and we are capable of voting responsibly. Still, our pleas are rebuffed, ignored, and met with insults. Our parades are blocked by ruffians. Some demonstrations become violent, and it is the women who are jailed. The public demonstration by women in the city was daring, even shocking. St. Louis was riddled with divisions between ethnic groups, racial groups, Southern and Northern U.S. traditions, and a political machine controlled by the beer brewing industry. Two years earlier, the suffragist petition drive had been rudely scorned by the state legislature. Suffragists risked censure and exclusion from all sides so they pursued the goal of voting in modest, ladylike tones. Although the organizers had prepared for months and the Golden Lane was no secret, the reality of women standing silent on a downtown street had an astonishing impact. So that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of what the Golden Lane was. Um, I'll just mention that the bottom picture on the cover was is a picture of Kate Richards O'Hare and she is in St. Louis. She's standing on the back of a car. There's a sea of men around her and she is lecturing them. She was um, a socialist and just a few 
months after this picture was taken, she was jailed in the Jefferson City Penitentiary. So I, I always like to start by um, quoting Gloria Steinem, who said that once people have rights, though they take the rights for granted. They didn't understand. They just, they just have a dull, a dull feeling. Um, and so we should really review why it was so important for women to get the vote and why they worked so hard to get it. And, and the reason was that it's a stepping stone and it's a stepping stone to social justice in the same way that the recent uh, competition for the Democratic nomination was is a stepping stone. We may not have a female president. We won't have a female president this time around, but um, we know that we're on, on our way. Probably in our lifetimes we will see it. And I also wanted to mention that there's a lot of women in the story who are nameless and they would, you know, work for work for a suffrage group for a while and then maybe disappear. And really, when I say disappear, um, they would vanish from the public record. One of these women was Geraldine Buchanan, and she was from Mid Missouri. She was from California, Missouri. And I'll just um, tell you a little bit about her. All we know about her suffrage activities come from an article covering Missouri suffrage work. And it was written by Agnes Lady in the Missouri Historical Review of 1920. And Lady was the state chairman of the Missouri Woman Suffrage Association. So this 1917, the legislature at that time only met in odd numbered years. And this lady wrote about 1917. This being a legislative year, it gave us an opportunity to present to the state legislature a bill for presidential suffrage. We opened headquarters in Jefferson City with Ms. Geraldine Buchanan of California, Missouri in charge, with some members of the state board present during the session. And this information has been repeated every time they uh, run into talking about that office or talking about Geraldine Buchanan. But I tried to, to find out more about her and found that it was really uh, difficult, even you know, with our, all the amazing resources we have, Ancestry.com and that kind of thing, um, you still really couldn't find much, much about her. She was from California, Missouri. She was the daughter of a successful California druggist, and um, they were a successful family. They had a huge house, and they were part of uh, the, you know, the movers and shakers in California. Um, the, the household was participated in the census in 1910, 1920, 1930, and they had a few servants, a uh, few other siblings for for Geraldine. But um, really, that's about all that we really know about her. Her marriage history was even hard to follow. There's, there's a record of a, a marriage to a guy named Cooper. And um, that, that one, we don't know if they had children or just how that worked out. Um, there was another marriage to somebody, or she signed, a, signed some papers later in her life using the last name of Parker, and there's no marriage certificate on that one at all. So, you know, women could just disappear without leaving so much as a trace. And um, the story of suffrage in Missouri or anywhere in, in the United States is a story of people who worked really hard and really didn't get a lot of recognition. It's impossible, for example, for us to find a list of folks who were at the Golden Lane. Uh, it just doesn't exist. But the story really starts a lot earlier, and I think that um, we have to pay a big salute to the women who worked and, and were at home during the Civil War. This is a picture from Harper's, 
and it shows refugees pouring in into St. Louis. And this is a, a family. It, it, uh, the explanation of it was that they were from North Missouri um, and North Missouri was, was uh, devastated and people just started pouring into St. Louis. There was no way for them to find out if their loved ones had been in a battle or if their loved ones were in a hospital or if they had died, except actually going to the place. So the St. Louis women were taking care of all of these refugees. They were finding them housing. They were finding jobs for the, the wives of, of uh, folks who, who um, had just really ba basically disappeared. And uh, they were taking care of things like growing all the food and preparing all of the food. So these women from St. Louis felt like they had served in the war just as the men had. Their work was unpaid and they were working in service to their country and to their families. This is a picture of Jefferson Barracks and uh, if you haven't been there, it still exists. It's a, a Civil War cemetery. This is um, a chance for me to say something about the Ladies' Union Aid Society. At, at the beginning of the Ladies' Union Aid Society, they had to show proof of unionist loyalty, and they operated pretty much in secret. And then in November of 1863, their mission was amended to include Confederate troops. Hundreds of women worked for the, the we call them the Luas, the group provided St. Louis Army hospitals with bandages that they cut and rolled themselves. They f raised money to find, to be able to get medical supplies, clothing, blankets, and food. And they had a first hand view of the ravages of war and poverty. They visited the sick, they read to the soldiers, they tried to provide comfort to the dying. They left a really well-documented set of contributions. They published daily summaries of their work and annual reports. In 1863, they reported that they were visiting the refugee home, the prison hospital, 684 destitute soldiers' families, and they staffed the kitchen at Benton Barracks, serving 19,382 meals between May and October. And they were funded basically by fundraisers and donations, and then they had a government contract to cut and assemble hospital garments. In that hospital garment project, they were able to put to work 500 soldiers' wives. So, you know, once again, we, it, why this comes as a surprise to us, I don't know, but once again, we learn that some of the hardest workers during a war are the women. Which brings us to Virginia Minor. And she was a real, a real hero. Uh, in 1865, the war ended and Virginia Louisa Minor was one of the women who were waiting to be re rewarded for their hard work. The work that helped secure a win for the North. She and her husband, Francis, had southern roots and had come from prosperous landowning families, but they were union sympathizers. They had never owned slaves. They came to St. Louis uh, hoping that Francis could be a lawyer in the, in the city, and they did find opportunity here. So here's a picture of, of Virginia. She's dressed in a modest dark dress with a white scarf around her neck, secured by a pin. If we could see Virginia in full view, we'd see that her dress, which has a little bit of pattern in the material, you can barely tell, um, is shaped by a whalebone corset and a full skirt reaching the floor. So the constriction on her body meant that she was just taking very small ladylike steps. Uh, there was a couple of months before there would be a national suffrage convention in St. Louis. And of course, this meeting could not have happened without the help of several prominent men 
who were sympathetic to the cause. Many of them were folks from Washington University and from the various churches. Actually, the Presbyterian and Methodist churches played a big part in this, and the Merc Mercantile Library. Um, the miners, although they were delighted with the onset of, of peace, had a had one son he was 14 years old in 1863 and he was killed not long after the end of the civil war he he was killed in a shooting accident so virginia just poured her energy into working for votes for women she tried to register to vote she was sent away they the women thought when the amendment passed to give universal voting rights to african american men that there would be no gender discrimination, but, um, but they were wrong. So her case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And, and when I say her case, it was her case, but she wasn't allowed to speak in court. So she was actually represented by her husband. So um, while I'm sure she would have liked to have spoken, her husband actually carried the, carried the water for that. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, well, yes, yes, women are citizens. They are citizens, but they're not the kind of citizens that can vote. So immediately, Virginia Minor, being who she was, um, maybe not immediately, but in a, a couple of years, helped found another organization in St. Louis that actually carried, uh, carried through till, till the end. I wanted to just show a picture of the bust of Virginia Minor. It's in the state capitol in Jefferson City, and uh, it's on the second floor. And next to that is Mary Mosley, who was a Fulton resident. Uh, she taught at William Woods, and she raised the $10,000 to uh, put that bust in the capitol. There are 46 Missourians in the Hall of Famous Missourians, and eight of them are women. And um, well, to me, Virginia Minor is the most significant one. So thank you, Mary Mosley, for getting that done. Uh, as I said, Virginia Minor, the next thing that she did was to, to uh, organize the St. Louis Women's Suffrage Association and the names of the women who were in it are you know, somewhat familiar to us. Um, Virginia Minor, of course, Eliza Patrick, Mary Todd, Phoebe Cousins, who was the first woman to get a law degree from Washington University, and uh, Eliza Buckley and Maggie Baumgartner. This was uh, published in the in the New York Times, it's really interesting how the New York Times followed St. Louis business, even though, of course, it was a uh, you know far away. The spheres. One of the things we have to understand before we, whenever we talk about women's issues during that time, is the is the spheres. This was a really well. Uh, a, well um, accepted theory on social relationships, on how relationships were built in society. Um, you know, we hear about this philosopher, Goethe, who was a German philosopher. He was sort of the, um, the carrier of the idea of the spheres, and he was published in all the magazines, including women's magazines, Everybody regarded him very highly, and and his well, it's more than it's more than a theory. Um, he maintained that true women were had had a job, and their job was taking care of the home. Um, true men, their job was taking care of business and politics and commercial. They were in another sphere. They were in the professional sphere, and they were the educated sphere, and. And they were the ones who uh, produced money. Women would have relationship with money through an allowance. 
Um, Phoebe Cousins was one that challenged that. And I'll just read one little quote from Phoebe Cousins. She says, woman has been regarded as created for man's self-love alone, with no soul to feel, no mind to expand, no brain to weigh argument, no individual accountability to render her maker. And thus the race has slowly, painfully climbed the heights of progress, dragging a dead weight. And unless some power can galvanize the slumbering virtue of this people into new life, we as a nation are doomed to irresistible disaster." Unquote. But here's the reality of the spheres. If there wasn't a man to take care of the woman, the woman was in poverty. Now, I have a couple of daughters. So this picture of these two beggars, they have a music box. Um, there, This is downtown St. Louis, comes from the Library of Congress. Uh, to me, it, she's maybe a widow. Maybe she's a woman who has a husband that is a drinker and, um, you know, spends his, spends his money before it, before it gets home. Um, we don't really know her story, but this is the reality. And as you read about women in the 1900s and into the, into the um, 1800s and into the 1900s, you will run into one time after another when women are supported by um, a man who is probably a relative or maybe a close friend or some kind of a benefactor. I, I'm working right now on a book about Mark Twain and the women that Mark Twain, um, who, who knew Mark Twain. And one of the things that I have found surprising is how many women he supported, you know, his mother, his sisters, his um, daughters, his, he had a lot of women writers that he sent money to. It's because they had no way to, to make their way. So here's a cartoon. This uh, shows the woman's sphere and here she is. She's peeking over the, the wall into, um, into, well, we don't know what, but uh, the caption says that she's, she's, um, oh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, well, I can't, but she basically, the caption basically says that she is, her head is full of frivolous, frivolous uh, ideas that she doesn't really have anything to think about. And in the bottom panel, she's voting and the caption says that now that she has the vote, she, she has, uh, you know, more, more to think about and she's not going to be so shallow. One of the things that made a huge change in history in the United States was the bicycle. And the, it's, it's a wonderful thing that the bicycle was lauded and uh, appreciated for its ability to give people exercise. So women were encouraged to ride the bicycle. As you can see from this picture, dresses got shorter. Um, pantaloons, of course, became part of bicycle culture. But the most important thing is that women could get around now. They, they didn't have to wait for somebody with a carriage to pick them up and drive them somewhere. Um, they, they were able to actually get around on their own. One of the things that happened right after the Civil War is the clubs, women's clubs. There were a couple of women. One of them was Julia Howe, who of course was a founder of the Girl Scouts, who traveled the United States encouraging women to form clubs. And how did they get to the clubs? They could bicycle to the clubs. So this was a, a huge step toward independence. Clubs were fun. Um, they were great training for women to become leaders. This is a 
just a picture of a suffrage song. All of the clubs that I've ever looked at had a song leader. Uh, and this is a, a book of suffrage songs. There were lots and lots of suffrage songs after the Civil War that were, that were um, founded. Of course, women, lots of women could play the piano. Women love to sing. They could sing. Um, it's kind of surprising that that has left our culture. I don't know why that's happened. But we do not appreciate music the way that women did then. They were kind of the entertainers of the family. You know, they, they had to learn how to play an instrument. It was sort of a skill that they could take to their marriage. This is a cartoon from the Ladies Home Journal. Um, the, the Ladies Home Journal had run an article by Glover, Grover Cleveland, and you can't really read it, but he is being chased right here by Susan B. Anthony. She is um, obviously going to beat him over the head with her umbrella. The book under his arm says, Woman's Mission and Woman's Clubs. And Grover Cleveland said, this is a quote from his article, let it be here distinctly understood that no sensible man has fears of injury to the country on account of such participation. It is its dangerous undermining effect on the characters of the wives and mothers of our land that we fear. So in other words, he's saying that, uh, you know, no respectable man would, would say that his wife couldn't join a club or even be against suffrage, but what's it gonna do to the country? What's it gonna do to the, to the family? This is just one of many journals that came out uh, reporting suffrage news. And this is 1913. By 1913, the women had gotten really organized and they were in on the East Coast forming parades. And I hope you can see at the bottom of this article, there's a picture of a parade and masses of people these were very organized events. They, they had a structure that the women uh, lined up in sort of ranks so that you had um, probably the, at the beginning, you had the leadership of the, of the whole suffrage movement. One of the folks that you will uh, see quite often is the woman on the white horse who, of course, was very glamorous and uh, a, a socialite. And she took her horse really coast to coast to march in parades and such. Missouri had quite a few parades, nothing of course as grand as the parades in New York and Washington DC, but um, we had our partic participation. In fact, we had a band from Maryville, Missouri that was the women's military band and the top picture shows them in in rank they're uh marching in washington dc what happened at that parade is there were a bunch of ruffians that came along and they decided to disrupt the parade but the military band lined up and played their entire repertoire which of course shocked the men, you know, here women with what, tubas and trombones and trumpets and um, oh my goodness, how do they, how can they even hold those things, those dainty little ladies? Um, but it stopped the ruffians and it gave enough time for the military that was stationed around Washington DC to come to the rescue of the, of the parade send the ruffians on their way and uh, the parade was able to continue. By 1916, there was going to be a, a political convention and the, conven the, the Republican convention was in Chicago. And this was, they were going to have a march in Chicago. This was the marching costume. Now I've seen many pictures of the Republican convention in Chicago. I've never seen one that had a woman with this much leg showing. Um, 
this costume. I think it was it was more of a publicity, you know, this is what we're gonna look like. But Carrie Chapman Cat said this outfit was much too liberal for the Southern Democrats in St. Louis and that we needed a different strategy in St. Louis. So the Republican convention had a march in Chicago. And then uh, here's, I, I love this picture of the Chicago parade with the elephants carrying the suffrage plank. And that's a good thing to think of that women were really working if, if we, I don't know that they thought of it as both sides of the aisles. They were both worth working in both parties. Uh, didn't seem to, in fact, that year they were able to get a plank on the platforms in both parties. But that's the, that's the picture that they, or that's the strategy they used in Chicago was let's have a couple of elephants carrying it. In St. Louis, we had a little bit of a different situation, but women were really having fun. And I think, you know, those two elephants kind of show the sort of wit that was happening by this time. In St. Louis, the women had decided that they wanted, they had, a, they had an office to, to uh, handle things like reservations if somebody from Denver wanted to come to the convention in St. Louis and, and participate in the Golden Lane. Um, they would call the office and the office would help them get reservations or find someone to stay with and, and get meals and that kind of thing. They wanted to have a donkey to tie in front of the office because I don't know if anybody listening to this has ever heard a donkey bray, but they're really, really loud and they can bray pretty incessantly when they decide to. So um, they, the, women wanted to have a donkey to tie in front of their office. So they found a donkey. They found a donkey in Illinois and they were going to bring the donkey to St. Louis, but they couldn't get the donkey to cross the Eads Bridge. It just, it just refused. Um, which if you've ever been around a donkey, you have no trouble believing that. Uh, so the St. Louis papers were following this. The St. Louis Star particularly was very sympathetic to the women. And this, and this gave them a lot of publicity because first of all, they had to, they were putting in ads to find the donkey, put it, getting attention that way. When they found this donkey from Illinois, of course, it was a great story that they couldn't get it to cross the Eads Bridge. Uh, finally, they found a donkey in Missouri, got him to St. Louis, and this is the picture that the St. Louis Star ran with the women in the cart and the donkey with a little umbrella over its head, or I guess a shade parasol over its head. Um, so a lot of publicity. They've gotten real smart about enjoying themselves and, uh, and getting publicity, which probably, probably is a big part of how this, how this, uh, success happened. This is the Missouri Woman, and this is a magazine that if you have time and you just want to stop by any of our state historical societies, they will have on microfilm the Missouri Woman, and it is absolutely worth your time to sit down and read it for a while if you're wondering what it was like to be a woman in 1917. This magazine carried club news, it carried school news, it carried PTA news, it had jokes, recipes, um, articles about your rights, it, how to, if, if you had to get a divorce, how you could, could go about it. It really was full of information and um, of course it also had great, great covers. I always ask people if they can read the music down at the bottom of the bottom of the page and I've rarely run into anybody today that can read that music but it would have been instantly recognizable to any anyone who had taken music music lessons a hundred years ago it's a reveille it's a wake-up call here's some covers from the Missouri woman and I just wanted to include them because I think it was such a great artistic piece of work. The one in the middle 
is sort of the official marching or the standing, I guess, costume for the Golden Lane, the, the white dress and yellow parasol. The white dress and the yellow parasol, um, stores got on board. They realized that they, they had a marketing opportunity here. So this is an ad from Stick Spare and Fuller. A lot of people would recognize that St. Louis business. Uh, they were selling the right clothes because, you know, we want to fit in. So there you go. That, that's where you would go. This is one of the ads for the Golden Lane, wanted 10,000 women recruits. You know, World War I was going on in Europe and it, the United States was in agony over whether to, uh, to join or not. There were marches quite often on both sides wanting to vote or not to vote. St. Louis actually had a, a pretty solid pacifist core um, at Washington University. And the, the, this ad kind of surprises me because of its kind of military um, tone, wanted 10,000 women recruits. But I think that was because it was the time and that's sort of how uh, you know, people pick up on what's, what's popular in, in culture. But really, many of the women that were really significant in the suffrage movement in St. Louis were um, pacifists and married to pacifist husbands. Oh, and I should mention one more thing about pacifists. Um, you'll often hear people say suffragette, the word, use this word suffragette. Um, in the United States and especially in St. Louis, the word was suffragist. The idea of a suffragette was a English, a British uh, word, a concept. And the suffragettes had gotten really violent. They had done things, they were doing things like blowing up people's houses. So the St. Louis group and really the most of the United States um, wanted to separate themselves. So they used the word suffragist. Okay, this is my favorite picture of the Golden Lane. It comes from the collection of, uh, at Bryn Mawr College um, of, uh, uh, oh gosh, whose was it? Well, anyway, this is, this is a picture from the point of view of the men. And this picture really tells a lot. For one thing, these guys are all kind of dressed alike. This is a club. This is a, a men's democratic club. Maybe from maybe from Milwaukee, maybe from Cleveland, maybe from Miami. We don't we don't know where they were from, but each club had its distinctive way of dressing, and they were marching from the hotel to the Coliseum. Of course, the women are are just kind of watching them. Some of the fun uh, comments that I've read about the women in the march is that they sort of they started out real nervous, and then as the men started looking at them and smiling and you know nodding to them, they kind of started to have a good time with it, and a little bit of flirtation was going on, and um, it, it kind of became a a fun event for them, not just a a very scary event. The other thing in this picture that I like is, I don't know if you can read it, but there's a sign. So it says green tree beer. And that reminds us that on the other side of the fight was the, brew, the beer brewing industry. And there were dozens and dozens of brewers in St. Louis. There was a railroad hub in St. Louis. And so especially the Anheuser-Busch folks could ship their beer. They had figured out how to, how to uh, cool cars to carry it and that was really the first national brand was um, beer from St. Louis. So they had a real, what, what the beer brewers were afraid of of course was prohibition and so the women had a real uh, adversary there. I will mention 
I'm sure a lot of people know this, but uh, prohibition actually passed before women got the vote. So women did not, did not uh, force that vote upon the men. The men actually voted it for themselves. I wanted to mention uh, Matilde Dolly Dahlmeyer Sheldon because she was born in Jefferson City. And of course this library is a Jefferson City institution. Um, she was uh, one of the Dahlmeyers. Her family built several buildings in St. Louis and I bet you guys could all walk to any of them. She was educated in St. Louis and went then to the National Park Seminary in Washington, D.C. And then when she returned, she helped organize the Jefferson City Art Club that was um, in 1903, and I believe it's still going on. She um, was active in the suffrage movement. She organized the Jefferson City Equal Suffrage League, and she scheduled herself for a round of speeches covering 21 counties. She was a fairly early advocate, and occasionally she and her chaperone were refused accommodations because of the controversy of her message. Even though her father was a Democrat, Dolly found the Republican message more to her liking, and in 1919, she became a delegate to the first National Conference of Republicans in Washington, D.C. That was the first one to which women were invited she uh, had met the years, a couple of years before at the convention in Chicago, the one with the elephants. She had met um, a prominent orthodontist from Kansas City named Frank Elwin Sheldon, and they announced that they were going to be married, and they announced that at the Republican convention in Chicago in 1917. So, um, She was an important credit to Jefferson City. They actually spent the rest of their, of their lives in Kansas City. So she was one of the elite in Kansas City. There's a couple of mammoth books that, that follow Kansas City, uh, the cultured folks of Kansas City, and she is mentioned in several of those. So you, you can find out a lot about her. She was an officer. I'll just read some of the credits that she racked up. Officer in the Rose Society, the Browning Society, the Art Institute, the Philharmonic, the Lyric Theater, Kansas City Museum, the Athenaeum Musical Club, and she always encouraged civic in involvement from others. She worked with the Women's City Club, the Girl Scouts, the Second Presbyterian Church, and the YWCA. So she's someone that Jefferson City can be proud of. So the question is always, have women voters changed the world? And US women um, have outvoted men uh, in every, they outvoted men, or they, we do outvote men in every presidential election since 1980. In the 2008, election 64 percent of eligible voters turned out and you know when you hear that we need to get better turnout that's what they're talking about 64 percent of the voters is uh nothing that you know we can brag about as a democracy um, more education means more likelihood that someone's going to vote and women are getting more educated we have um women right now are getting more advanced degrees. One of the interesting things to me was the number of unmarried women that um, are registered voters. However, they don't vote in the same numbers as married women, but they could really change an election if they, if they turned out at the polls. Okay, well, that's about what I've got. Um, I think if there's folks that have things they want to share, I would love to hear if anybody knows any of their family members that went to the Golden Lane. Um, 
if, if any of those stories came down through families because as I said, we do not have a list of who was there. So it would be just great to get that list started. So Madeline. Yes. Just, um, do you have a way to, to do a discussion or is? I've unmuted everyone. So, okay. so if there's chat, you can submit a question. That's what I see here. So. Well, I can tell you um, one story that I, that I love about one, Thing that happened in, in a talk in, that I did in Kansas City. Um, at the end of the talk, this, the woman came up to me and she said she wanted to know about the, the Maryville Band, a little more about the Maryville Band. And I said, well, you know, there's a little bit of writing about it. I told her where to look for some information. And she said, you know, I think we have her drum. And I said, huh? And she said, well, when we moved into this house, um, in the attic, there was a box, and it said on the top of the box, carried in the 1913 suffrage parade in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And well, I was a little bit shocked. Um, but I said, you know, what you should probably do is get a hold of some folks at Maryville, at the, at the Historical Society in Maryville, and uh, ask them, you know, if there's a way that you can authenticate it, I know they would just love to have it. So she did. And they learned that the drum had been donated by Alma Nash. Alma Nash was the name of the, of the leader of the band, that Alma Nash had donated it to a Kansas City museum as a fundraiser. And it had been si uh, sold at a, an auction. A fundraising auction and um, it the auction the winner was the fellow who had lived in the house that this woman had moved into so they were able to authenticate that as well as they could that this indeed was Alma Nash's drum and it ended up back in the Maryville Historical Society where it should certainly be uh, so if anybody has any mysterious drums in their attics or mysterious suffrage memorabilia maybe we can help it find a home so well thank you so much margo um for those who are in the audience we are going to archive this program so we'll be able to see it uh, again you can tell your friends and others who might be interested so thank you again margo Thank you, Madeline. I really appreciate the opportunity. It was fun. Yeah, for sure. More than 70 years of struggle, for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. And here well, we are. Well, more. Uh, well, more. Do, do vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the parting word is everybody, don't forget to vote. That's right. That's right. I want everybody to turn out. Okay. Well, good night. <laughs> good night. Thanks, Madeline. Okay. Thank you, Marco. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.